Hey, solopreneurs, quick note before this episode kicks off. This is part of the How to Grow Your Business series. I'm bringing in a whole bunch of experts between uh, how to grow your business on LinkedIn to how to handle uh, your team and make sure that you're managing your contractors the right way to really help you grow your business. I hope you enjoy these uh, episodes and have a fantastic listen. Hey, solopreneurs, Gabe here. Today we have Nicholas Townsend Smith of the Giants and the Smalls, and he's going to teach us how to live a giant life. This was a fantastic conversation, and I'm looking forward to you hearing it. Hey, Nick, thanks for being on Solopreneur Money. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, well, we're, we're going to talk about um, how to live a giant life. And I, you know, you, you were gracious enough here a few weeks ago to send me a copy of your book, which was fantastic. I actually got it right here for those watching on, on YouTube, the giants and the smalls. And we're going to talk about the lessons in that. Uh, but before we go there, I, I always got to hear your story. So help me understand your story, Nick. What brings you here? Yeah. Let me go all the way back in time to where it began. And uh, it probably began before that, but this is what I remember. So I'll tell it from there. It was 2009. So just after the market crash of 2008, uh, I was in foreclosure. I was bankrupt. I was uh, getting food at a food bank. And so that's how I provided. And I did what any smart person would do in that situation. I decided I would become a life coach and a professional speaker. <laughs> and so that's what I did. <laughs> yeah, when you're in the throes of darkness, just just go for it, right? So I, uh, I shared that with a friend and did my first speaking event in November of 2008, actually. And uh, she said, you've got to meet this gentleman named Steve Hardison. And I didn't know anything about this guy. I just knew I needed to talk with him and to watch for his call. And so he called when I was sitting in the parking lot of a food bank. I was getting ready to go in and grab some food. And he and I talked for about an hour. And it was an impactful conversation. It's still, the emotion of that still is with me today. And this was 12, 13 years ago. But in that conversation, I don't remember all of the conversation. I just remember how I felt. And so I felt like I mattered, like I could do something. I remember asking him a question. I asked him, can you? And before I can finish it, he says, yes. And I say, how can you say yes if you don't know what I'm going to ask? And he says, there's nothing that you can ask that's bigger than me. And that question stuck with me. And my life didn't change drastically after that conversation. I, I ended up going and getting a job with my brother, working up in Park City. Every day I'd drive to work, I'd listen to books. I listened to about 70 to 80 books a year and just really take in as much information as I could. I was listening to Who Moved My Cheese by Spencer Johnson. Just a really great story, metaphor. And I remember listening to that thinking, I could write this. I could write something like this. And I didn't know what I would write about, but I remember seeing the homes on the hill and seeing these mansions. And here I am feeling just incredibly small. And I thought, how are they doing it? How are they living these giant lives while I'm living such a small life? And that became the seed of this book. So I, I bought a voice recorder, this thing right here, that's the one. And I would, uh, I would record this story as I would drive to work. And it became the story called The Giants and the Smalls. And, and uh, I would share it with my kids and my kids got the message. I wanted to teach from the space of not entitlement, not inheritance, but earning. And so we would, uh, I would share that message with them and they would come out saying giant things. They would say, I'm going to be a giant. Uh, we would ask them questions, you know, what would a giant do if they were scared to do something? And they would, they would show up differently, more powerful. And so I knew the message was working. So I wrote it for me and my kids. It was, it was a message of what might it be like to stand on the shoulders of a giant and be uh, mentored through the process of becoming a giant. And so I wrote it from that view based on that conversation I had with Steve Hardison. So in the story, Steve Hardison is the giant and I'm the small. And that was, uh, that was 2009 that I finished writing it. And I thought it would just be a wild success and just take off from there. And, and uh, it, it didn't. <laughs> it just kind of <laughs> sat. <laughs> in 2011, I found my artist and I was on Deviant Art, and I knew the colors and the buildings and the styles that I wanted. And I found this gentleman out of Argentina, Juan Tumburos, and he had the style I wanted. He's a comic book artist. 
and we created an agreement around the, the style, created the characters and really got in line with what they would look like. And then he told me what it would cost to get the illustrations done and I didn't have it. So I went to work and did a Kickstarter in 2011. And out of my $10,000 goal, I raised $800 and didn't complete the Kickstarter. And with Kickstarter, if you don't finish it, you don't get any money. And so I was, I was on pause and I made an agreement at that time to go back to work full time and better, get a better job and to go back to school. And so I committed to do that. So for the next six years, I did nothing with the book, just set it aside went back to work uh, doing car sales and then went and got my uh, master's degree in industrial psychology. And so I graduated with honors while working full time, raising kids. And uh, in 2018, finally got the money together to pay for the illustrations for the book. My marriage was getting rocky at that point. In 2018, I paid for an illustration a month for a year. And by 2019, she and I had separated and I needed something to hold me kind of in this, in this world. And so that book became the thing. And in October of 2019, we got divorced and that was some of the darkest times of my life. And that book became the anchor. It, it became the thing that held me here. It gave me purpose. It gave me a reason to keep moving forward. And uh, in 2019 in November, I ran into Richard Paul Evans at an event, a random event, and he was doing an author's course. And so I decided I would do that. And in 2020, we got the book all redesigned and put together. And with the help of Rick Evans, we launched on March 17th, 2020. We were going to do a live event and the economy shut down again. Oh. So again, second time, the economy is just gone. And uh, our live event, we went online and did a Kickstarter and pivoted. And it took off like an albatross. It was, uh, it was going flatline, basically. I don't know if you've seen an albatross run across the beach to try and take off. It's not pretty. And that was about <laughs> how our Kickstarter took off. And about a week before the Kickstarter was to end, we asked a friend of ours who's a pretty successful publisher, distributor. We said, what do we do? And he's an atheist. And he said, well, if it were me, I'd pray. <laughs> and so, you know, if an atheist is saying you got to pray, there's not much of a chance you're going to make it. And then he said, if I, if I didn't do that, here's what I'd do. And he said, I would reach out to anyone and everyone I knew to create this. And so we did. And uh, within the last week, it, it took off like a rocket. And we reached the goal, printed 2,500 copies of the book, started developing the platform that's now called the Tribe of Giants on Facebook. And we have global membership in that. And then we have Wake Up With Giants TV, which is our network and wake up with giants radio and podcast. And so now we've got a global community of people calling themselves giants. We burned through the first round of books and ordered another round, did another Kickstarter. And here we are today. We're, we're pushing on toward the vision of impacting 100 million lives globally and uh, the vision of creating this into a Pixar style movie. That is beautiful. That's an amazing story all the way back from 08, two major shocks to the economy. Um, let alone going from a food bank line to divorce to to raising your kids to I mean you've had a roller coaster of a last well I'll do the math real quick fourteen years I mean that's a roller coaster of fourteen years um, a nice job sticking it out and staying here um, I mean I'm proud of you for that I mean I know we just met but I'm proud of you for sticking it out through that fourteen years that's crazy. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, so help me understand. Um, actually, I got to stop for a second. Yeah. Um, and and not stop from uh, an editorial standpoint, but you said a name, Steve Hardison. Is Steve Hardison a coach? Yeah. Okay. So we're recording this in, in the middle of the beginning of March. I was just on my way back from Big Sky, Montana. I went out snowboarding uh, with my one of my daughters and my buddies. We go every single year to someplace different. And I'm driving home and I'm listening to a book called Black... No, wait, it wasn't Black Hole Focus. It was another one by a gentleman who is a real estate guy who talked about Steve Hardison being his coach. Um, total side bar to our conversation Interesting. but yeah that's the second time i've heard his name as a coach in the last few weeks probably won't be the last he's uh he's a gentleman that um 
is committed to creating an impact in the world and reminding people of their greatness, of who they be and who they create themselves to be. The Giants and the Smalls is a foundational form of that. And what he does is higher level coaching around you know, how to be because it's who you're being that creates everything in your world. And so it, that's that's what his module is. And uh, he's an interesting character because he he has a book out there called The Ultimate Coach. And it was written by Amy Hardison and Alan Thompson. And it's a history of his life and then tributes from people that have been impacted by his way of being. And so he, he really inspires people to show up fully, to get committed in their lives and to, to tr transform it. So that conversation, even back in 08, 09, uh, still sticks with me because of the way this guy is. Uh, and I've never hired him as a coach. He, he just, he's on our show this morning. We did a show this, this morning and he's on there commenting. It's like, where do you find the time? <laughs> and he just does. He creates it. It's wow. Amazing. Wow. That is amazing. That, that is amazing. Well, um, I got to figure out some way to get him on my show then, since I've heard about him in a book and you have, uh, chatted with him. Maybe sometime we can arrange that. Well, when you do let me know, cause I've been trying to get him on my show too. Ah, very good. Not something that he does. <laughs> Love it. Love it. All right. So, so anyways, here we are. Um, you have now created a company, you've created a brand, you've created a life of really helping people for lack of any other way to put it, live giant lives. Yeah. So you, you had said something in your book about these journeys. And when we had a conversation, I believe it was 12 journeys. Um, how about you share those? Where did those come from? How did they come about? What are the journeys? Help me understand that. The, the book is written in the, the format of a journey of a small who becomes a giant. It's an internal journey that each of us goes on. It's not about one group against another. It transcends culture, race, age, religion, politics, all of that. So you can, you can overlay it on just about anything, but there are certain components of it that show up consistently. The unconsciousness, the awareness, the waking up to the way of being that you have. So in the story, I start out with a small who's completely unconscious. He's lived a small life. He doesn't know any different. His family is small. So going all the way back through his history, this is all he knows. And then one day he hears distant laughter and he looks up and sees the giants, which takes him into the journey of awareness. And I'll go into each of these in detail so that we can have a, a construct of what they are. And so he goes into awareness and from that awareness, he starts to share with others and awareness immediately moves into the grief cycle, the journey of grief. So he tells friends and family about what he's thinking and he sees the giants and he wonders if he can be like them. And then all these old thoughts come up of you can't be giant. Who are you? Who are you to ask these big questions? Giants are giants. You're just a small, which is the inner dialogue that each of us has. And then you move into acceptance, the journey of acceptance. You move into the journey of gratitude. And when you get to that space where you're okay with what is, and you get into that gratitude space, now you've got a fertile ground for creating anything that you want in your life, which moves us into the journey of uncertainty, where a lot of people feel really uncomfortable and they go back to their unconscious behaviors. And so what carries us through uncertainty is vision. And when you can create a clear vision on the other side of uncertainty, it carries you through. It's like Steve Jobs says, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only do that back looking backward. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect. As I have the vision of the book and the movie and all these things that we're creating, I have the vision. I have a really imperfect path. And so everything's a possibility at that point. There's a, a great quote that says that when nothing is sure, everything is possible. And when it comes to your vision, when you don't know how you're going to do it, then everything's a possibility. But we get so hung up on our paths that when that doesn't work, then we give up on our dreams. We don't have the persistence because our way didn't work. And I don't think that's the way it's supposed to work. So then you go into the journey of nurturing, the journey of surrender, the journey of abundance, recognizing that there's plenty for everyone. And then you move into feeling good and then giving back. And so these are the journeys that each of us will have to go through. And so when it comes to unconsciousness, it's really the goal of everything, creating automatic behaviors that we don't have to think about. Uh, Alfred North Whitehead said that the, we advance by the number of important operations that we can do without thinking. 
and the body is designed for automation. And so at a certain point, they say on average, 66 days is what it takes to create a new habit. And it's, it ranges anywhere from 18 to 257 days, I think is the, the range for creating a habit. But automation is the goal, but also, also automation is the thing that's keeping us from everything that we want because we have some automatic behaviors that just really don't serve us. If I really dive into unconsciousness, I'll be teaching this tonight in an SG group, the Sum Gigante groups. And uh, Sum Gigante means I am giant in Latin. And so in these groups, the, the journey of unconsciousness is the first week. And tonight we'll be teaching about the brain. And so the way the brain works and operates is you have neurons, you have 86 billion neurons. You have about 85 billion glial cells, and people don't know about the glial cells as much as they do the neurons, but the glial cells are the things that come in and support the neurons. So when you have a new neural connection, the glial cells come in to, to make it more efficient. So you have astrocytes that wrap the synaptic connections and hold the structure in place. You have oligodendrocytes that come in and wrap the axon to create what's called a myelin sheath, and that causes it to fire faster and faster and more automatically. And then you have microglia that go in and clean everything up and flush out the, the, the bad because you can't have enzymes in your brain. And then as your brain fluid flushes, then that clears it out of your system. So it's a really efficient system. You have about a thousand connections per neuron in your brain. So trillions, trillions of connections. You could store over a million gig of information, which is all of the information that could ever be stored in the world, the internet, you could put the entire internet in a single human brain, just to give you a sense of the capacity. And so we have limitless, literally limitless capacity to create anything that we want. But then we have these stories that come in that are created and manufactured that block that ability. So we have this story that says, I'm not good enough. The story that says I'm broke. The story that says my family did this, so this. And then we tell those stories as though they're true. And in that unconsciousness, we automate the behaviors around that and then continue to create that as our reality. And so in the story, the, the giants and the smalls, writ is in that space of taking those generational teachings, the cultural teachings and running that, that program and not really questioning it. He lived out a, a small life completely until one day he found out there's another another way to do it. And so in the journey of unconsciousness, it's really recognizing all the unuseful behaviors, thoughts, emotions that aren't serving us and bringing them to the surface. And then once you do, that's where awareness kicks in. A lot of people don't know what to do. It's so uncomfortable. They numb out. They go into grief. They go into anxiety, depression. So when you come into awareness, you're bringing to the surface. There's nothing to do in unconsciousness. If you're unaware, you're not going to do anything. You're just going to do it and you're going to question. You might know something, but you're still going to do the unconscious behaviors. And you have three levels. You have unconsciousness, you have pre-consciousness, and then you have consciousness. And then you have this higher version of yourself that oversees it all. So the higher self. And so in unconsciousness, you're dealing with underlying deep rooted uh, cultural and familial beliefs and systems. You're also dealing with traumas and neglect. And so these are underlying everything else that's built on top of that. When you get into the subconscious or pre-conscious, those are things that you can actually bring to the conscious awareness. But for the most part, they're, they're automatic. You don't have to think about them like driving a car. If you needed to manually take over on the car, you can bring that to your consciousness, drive the car and then re-automate it. And so it gives you a, a level of functioning that you normally wouldn't have. That's why people will end up at work and not know how they got there. And then in consciousness, that's the area where we create from. That's where we create ourselves. That's where we create our dreams and visions. And if, if we're not careful, then our automatic behaviors will come in and rule that. So we'll have the vision and then our automatic behaviors will come in and over, overrun it. And so consciousness requires us to pay attention for long enough for that to become an automated behavior. And so awareness is simply bringing things into consciousness. It's bringing them in and out of subconsciousness. So that we can work on them because when we can work on them we can change them and then when you get into the heavier emotions you know the traumas the neglect that's where it's really beneficial to have somebody that can work through those with you because a lot of times we can't see those on our own and so that's where therapy comes in and uh behavioral you know teachings like tre things like that for trauma that help release some of that energy from the body knowing how to do that sometimes we can't do that work on our own 
And so that's where coaches might come in. That's where therapists would come in. So our vision with uh, with awareness is really to work on the stuff we can work on, the subconscious stuff that we can automate, but we can also bring back to the surface because that's where the biggest change is for us. And uh, as we create awareness, what happens is people go into the grief journey. So the journey of grief is simply this. On the other side of grief is this love for the experience and a reverence for the experience and ultimately a gratitude for the experience. But in, in grief, depression is one of those tools inside of grief that could really serve us. But people look at depression as harmful, unuseful. And if we really understand depression, uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett in her work around anxiety and depression says that depression occurs when we're failing to live up to our own ideals. And anxiety occurs when we fail, up, fail to live up to the ideals of others. And so we don't we feel like we don't measure up. In depression, what it's meant to do is get you to pull energy from things that aren't working. You'll notice a decrease in effort or emotion, a decrease in energy, and we don't want to move forward on the project that we're working on. So, uh, whether it's a relationship, career, or anything else, we have a pullback. And so in that pullback of energy, in that depressive state, we get in touch with reality the way it is. So we're no longer in our delusion of our vision and having fun chasing that vision. Now we're in reality and we get to look at it like it is. What it does is it has us look at things that we're doing and really reflect on them. And in that reflection and rumination, those emotions that come up with those thoughts are pretty heavy. So people numb out and they go right back into their unconscious behavior. So they don't learn from the depression, move in another direction that might be useful. And so if you can have a reverence for the pulling back, for the rumination, the reflection, the reality, then you have a chance to recreate it. And then you re-engage and we call that process resilience. So the quicker you can move through that, the more resilient you become. And so in the story that's that's built in there as the journey of him sitting on the curb with his head in his hands, listening to these thoughts that say, you can't do this and looking at reality like it is. Is this all there is to life? How many of us have done that? Mm -hmm. And yeah. We sit, yeah. What comes up as you hear that? Well, what's coming up is I'm I'm trying to think, all right, because you're you're very, very well versed in the uh, science of the this. And I can tell that you've studied this and the intelligence and, and, and I'm sitting here going, okay, those things that are connecting stuff in my brain, those big <laughs> words, and yeah. I'm going, but wait a second, let me, let me, let me step back. And let me put it into in into something so people could really like get their mind around it. Really, what you're saying is, okay, I realize that I'm not where I want to be in my life. Yeah. All right. Somebody and, and says, I'm going to make a change. I have a vision of what I'm going to do. I'm excited. And maybe we'll just use the beginning of the year, the workout time. All right. Yeah, it's the yeah. beginning of the year. I'm ready to get in shape. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to do everything right. I'm going to get up in the morning. I'm going to go to the gym and I get to the gym and I'm like, I don't know what the hell to do here. Yeah. And so if you don't know what the heck to do here, you then automatically look at yourself, some people, uh, and they might even, I'm using this as an example, might look at themselves and go, wait a second, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't deserve to be here. I shouldn't be here. I feel like a dummy. And by the way, that chick over there and that dude over there is looking at me funny. So now I don't feel good. I, feel, I, I don't feel good about being here. Therefore, I might go get in my car. I might drive back home, crawl back in bed, and now I'm not moving forward. So I'm taking what I'm hearing from you and I'm going, how can I make this really like c connect? Yeah. Or anything you, you have this awakening to, I've been doing life this way for so long. And that, and we now know the mechanics behind it. Your body is designed for that. So you've been doing life this way for so long, whether it's money or fitness or food or anything else. And then you have an awakening to it. And this is where it moves into the not okayness. I'm not okay with the way it is. I'm not okay with me being like this. I'm, I'm overweight, let's say. I don't want to be like that. So there's, there's resistance to it, which moves us into the journey of acceptance because it, acceptance is simply, it is what it is. That's all, it, that's all that means. And within acceptance, there's two versions. There's accommodation and allowance. So if, if you have that acceptance, it doesn't mean that's the way it's going to be permanently, but there's room for it. So you're at the gym and you see yourself, if you're not okay with your not being okay, then it creates shame and all these other emotions. And you tend, you tend to go back to your automatic behaviors or you numb out, right? You numb out with food or alcohol or drugs or whatever it is that 
gets all this to shut off. Oh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and, and we could even take this into a, a, a business side and then I'm going to let you keep going, but let's say you're looking at your business. So you're a sole opener sitting out here and you're just getting by, you're just scraping by. Okay. You're looking at it and going, all right, I'm not making it. I am not getting to where I need to go. I'm realizing that. And I got two choices. I can buck up and figure out how to fix it. Or I can just keep doing what I'm doing and realize I'm not going to get anywhere. Do more of what's not working. It's a really efficient way to do things. <laughs> it's a great way to live. Isn't yeah. it? <laughs> Push harder on that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, no, I love it. I had to jump in with, a, all right, here's how I see this. And, and I will add one more thing. Um, you just taught me something that it, it, I have never ever taken the time to even think about. But the cause of depression and the cause of anxiety, I've never thought about it. Uh, but the cause of depression is not living up to your own potential or your own standards or your own whatever. And the anxiety comes from the not living up to the standards of others. Um, I instantly thought of a buddy of mine that I've known for many, many years that this guy is brilliant, but he was always depressed after college. I couldn't figure out why. And I just instantly thought of him when you thought of like this guy, I think, kind of didn't ever live up to really what his true potential was. And I think I, I, it now, it now connects for me on that depression piece. So I got to tell you right now, after this much of the podcast, I've already learned something, man. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. I, I love that you tied it in too, because it, it, it truly is that if we were to break it down to the simplest form, it would be that we do it everywhere. The, the idea that, we might feel depressed about a situation. There's also the prediction. So prediction is pre words before we speak it, we play it out in our minds before we speak it. And as from that speaking, you start to create it in your world. And so anxiety also comes from that prediction because we'll get into the prediction of this is how it's going to go. And then we do that prediction based on what we've experienced. So that's the remembered, they call it the remembered presence. So you bring all your memories in, and you bring it into the present moment, and then you predict from all those memories about what's going to happen in the future. So a guy who's depressed is going to go out there and say, well, I've been depressed, and this is what's happened, and I'm going to predict the future based on what I've experienced. And all I see is the same thing. So there's a, there's a depression from something that hasn't even happened yet. There's a pulling back of energy because your prediction is that it's going to go the way it always has, and so you don't do anything with it. So playing with that it, in the world of acceptance and gratitude, this is the way out is when you can accept that it is what it is. Uh, John Patrick Morgan, he says that acceptance is simply, there's two versions, accommodation and allowance. Accommodation means it can move in with you. It's permanent. I'm going to leave it here. It can be a part of my life. It's allowed to be here for as long as I want to keep it here. It's got a room in my house. It can eat my food and everything. Allowance is simply it has a ticket to be there. So it's like going to the movies. You've got two hours. If you start building your house or you start moving in, that's not going to work because all you have is a ticket to be here. But they're all within the realm of acceptance. It simply is what it is. And there's accommodation and allowance within that. And when we get into that space of it is what it is,ness, then we become powerful because we're no longer defined by it. We don't identify as it. And then we can move into the space of gratitude. You'll hear people often say after a, a difficult experience, like a, a loss of a loved one, their house burns down. They'll say, at least I have this. And that's a form of gratitude. And they, they say that gratitude, if it's done too frequently, becomes a to-do list. And if we get into to-do to list, there's no emotion tied to it. So it's non-beneficial. They say once a week, if you can really get into the emotion of gratitude, just documenting and journaling it, It'll be more impactful than if you did it every day. Yet we're taught to do a to-do list or a checklist and just get it done. And then it becomes mechanical and mundane. And then we're back into automation, which is in creation, the thing that we want to get away from to create it differently. Well, now you move into a, a space of uncertainty. So now you've gotten all this, this place where your, your ground is, is nutrient rich. And now you want to plant something in it. And you're like, I, I don't know what to plant. So just like a garden, you go pick your seeds, create your vision. The word purpose comes from purpose, pausar, to move forward to rest. That's what the word comes from. Uh, Victor Frankl, in his work, he talks about creating a purpose. So if a purpose is like a rest stop on a trip, 
and it's a place you're going to go to and, and pull over and rest for a minute, then you're going to pick another one and another one and another one. So to limit ourselves to one purpose for life is, is ridiculous because then that would say that's all we are. And a purpose, if it's made up, we could have myriad purposes. We could have infinite purposes. And so we'll just create as many visions as we want. So when you get to the land of uncertainty and you don't know what you're going to plant, the first thing I have people do is start with vision. Let's create as many visions of the future as we can. And I, I do it from the space of pre-membering in the words of Lydia Nibley. Uh, Catherine Lee says, let's create a memory of things yet to be as though they're a memory, but they haven't happened yet. And so when I write vision, I don't write from how I did it. I write it as though it's already done. I have a, a journal called 5,000 Things based on the, the book, The uh, Happy Pocket Full of Money, which I think is a great little book. So he talks about 5,000 things. And so I started my own journal where I create a vision as though it's already happened of 5,000 things that I will create in my life. And I think I'm on number 56 and, and probably 10 to 15% are already realized and the rest are in process. And I've got a long way to go. Like if I have 5,000 things, I'll never run out of visions. I'll never run out of purposes. So I start with vision. And when you know where you're going, then going back to the quote of Steve Jobs, you don't have to worry about the how. The nurturing is simply nurturing the steps as they come. It's like becoming Lewis and Clark in your life. You go out and you take the steps that you need to take. And now if somebody's done it, then you can shortcut that because you can follow their process. Then by all means, get on that highway. I'm going to check in with you. What are you hearing inside of that? Oh, man. Um well, the first thing I keep thinking about it, there's a section, and this is not a, a uh, it's a bit of a shameless plug. I actually have a line in my book that when your vision is clear, your decisions are easy. And so what you're, you're basically saying is, is okay, when you have your vision figured out as to where you're trying to go, you then need to start to trust it. And things will start to show themselves as to where you need to go and what you need to do um, to kind of piggyback on that. So th that's the piece that I'm hearing now is let's get our vision figured out. I love the idea of 5,000 visions. Um, and I just finished reading the book, uh, the, the blue zones about how, you know, all the centenarians around the world, there are, I believe it's six blue zones around the world. And one of them is, uh, Osaka, Japan, an area outside of Osaka, Japan. And they talk about, uh, these, these villages of people that are well over a hundred years of age, they're centenarians, um, and they're very healthy. They're, they're still social, they're doing things. And they talk about in the, in the Japanese language, in the Japanese culture, an ikigai. And the ikigai is your purpose. Well, you just created, in my mind, a lifetime of purposes. That 5,000 purposes is amazing. So that's what was, that was what was sitting with me. And I was thinking, all right, I get it. I, I, I connect those two together. Well, imagine all the places where you're small. So the places where there's potential for growth. That's where the work is. It's not where you're giant. If you're giant around money, but you're not around relationship. Well, now you go through the 12 journeys around relationship and it's all about capacity. When you start out on this, on the journey, you might start with an imperfect plan. I, I had a plan to go out to Pixar studios on February 22nd to initiate creating the movie. Well, I get out there with my imperfect plan and cases of books and I get out to the studio for Pixar studios and it's like Fort Knox. There's 15 foot walls and a gate, a guard gate, and they won't let you through. So my idea and my vision was all of a sudden blocked by this wall and this barrier. So I had to pivot and in pivoting, people were watching the journey and they started contributing and collaborating around how we can create this. Now it's not just my creation. It's, it's a collaboration, collaborative creation. So the, the beauty of all of this is that there will always be collaboration no matter what, but we also increase in our capacity. So as we start on our imperfect plan, we build our skill set. James Malinchek talks about this, you know, creating your mindset, then your skill set, and then get off your assets. So you got to do something about it. But in the giant's journey, you're always taking these small steps. And then when you repeat, small steps repeated create complexity. So Benoit Mandelbrot is, I'm a fan of his. He's a mathematician that created an equation that when you add the solution back into the equation, it increases in mass and it creates this artwork and this complexity. It's beautiful. You see it in Romanoff broccoli. You see it in river systems, highway systems, networks, 
It's throughout the entire universe. It's simple equations repeated create complexity in our lives. So giants are still taking small steps. They're just bigger in capacity. So there's no difference. They're still doing the things that are within their realm of, of reason, but they're just bigger. They've built up their skill set to be able to do it. So the story writ is a small and he doesn't need to know the mechanics behind it. He needs to surrender the pathway, but he trusts and he walks where he's at. And when he's following the giant, the giant's way out ahead of him and is walking and he's running to keep up. And it's just capacity. It's you might be starting at a lower capacity than somebody else, but as you stick with it and you learn new things and develop those skill sets, you start to create yourself in such a way that you can do, going back to that question to Steve Hardison, anything. You can do anything. And surrendering the path. I see a lot of people that get so hung up on how they're going to get to their vision. It would be like climbing Mount Everest and expecting the weather to be perfect and you get there and it's not. And so because it's not perfect and you had your plan, you give up on your dream because your plan was the way it was going to happen. And I see people give up on their dreams because their pathway didn't work and it eliminates all the possibilities that are around them. I think Christopher Reeve said that uh, you, you go from possibility at first dreams seem, seem improbable, impossible, then improbable and then inevitable. And so we move through that possibility to probability to certainty. Uh, Nicholas Nassim Nicholas Taleb in The Black Swan talks about certainties. Everything's a possibility. Some things are probabilities and very few things are certainties. And we want the certainties before we begin. And we, we act as though our path is that certainty. And it, and it might not be. What happens if it doesn't go that way? What if the path is different, but you blocked it off because all you could see is your path? So I, I think the vision is what holds us and keeps us going so that when things come up, challenges come up, they're, they're not blocks. They're not detours. They're stepping stones because we have our vision. If the weather comes up, then we pivot. We move around it. You know, 12, 13 years later, I haven't given up on my vision. I've just found a lot of ways not to do it. <laughs> it's going into Thomas Edison, right? 10,000 ways that didn't work, but he found the one that did. Yeah. Because he's pursuing possibilities. What do you hear in that? Um, I just, I hear the idea that, that we as uh, people, uh, whether we're, it doesn't matter what we're doing in the world, but when we have a vision, we just continue to keep moving forward. And we, you could use the fail fast. You could use the Thomas Edison. You could use any of the examples, but the reality of the situation is we just need to keep taking steps forward towards our vision. And it's never going to be exactly like you think it's going to be. It's going to be different. And usually it's better. Yeah. And, and it's all made up. Mm -hmm. It's all made up. The, the beauty of Viktor Frankl's work, he has a book called Yes to Life. It came out just recently. He had Man's Search for Meaning and then Yes to Life. And in both of those books, he talks about the importance of purpose, that when you have a purpose, it gives you a reason to live. It gives you a reason to move forward. And, and happiness and hope are found within purpose. And purpose is simply a vision that we made up. It's a place to rest. When we get there, we'll create another one. And so there is no limit to the visions that we can have. There is no limit to the purposes we can create. And it's inside of that. We don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to get a movie made. I don't know anything about movies, but I find myself pursuing capacity so that I can create that. Creating relationships, contacts, conversations that weren't there without that declaration and that vision. So the moment I get into the vision, I say, this is what I'm going to do. This is where we get into integrity, agreement, and commitment. Agreement is I, I'm going to do this thing. Commitment is the activity around it. The word commit means to do. Integrity is the sim simply the delta or the difference between that agreement and that commitment. It's not a shame thing. It's nothing else. It just says in relation to your word and what you do in the world, this is where your integrity is between those. So there are some people that everything they say becomes a reality in the world. They do what they say because of who they're being. And there are other people that they say they're going to do things and none of that happens. So their integrity level with that is really low, but it's not a shame thing. It's just evidence of your, your gap between commitment and agreement. So here I am pursuing that gap, closing the gap or creating the bridge between that and, you know, the agreement and commitment by pursuing possibilities. I don't know. This is where surrender comes in the journey of surrender to render over to another higher power self, whatever it is, 
I'm turning over to that, that the pathway will appear. All I know is I'm going to act on whatever comes and I'm going to hold the vision. How it comes about, that part's not up to me. My, my job is to act and step. I love that. I absolutely love that. So where, where are we at in the 12 journeys? Have we made our way through? I'm not counting. So, so we got three more. So there's abundance. Nice. Yeah, abundance. And then we've got feeling good and also giving back. So abundance is simply the idea that you didn't have to create oxygen today so that you could breathe. Elon Musk didn't have to create Mars so that he could fly to it. The materials are already here. We hear of scarcity and lack and resources are limited, and yet people continue to create success. Abundance is already there. It's our birthright. It's around us. And it doesn't matter where you're born in the world, you can create with the abundance that's around you. And if we look at the laws of thermodynamics, energy isn't created or destroyed. It's just transformed. Abundance isn't created or destroyed. It's just transformed from the form it's in to the form that you're creating it as. Uh, Elon Musk didn't have to create all the materials to create a rocket ship to go to Mars. I mean, he just transformed them from the form they were in to another form. Money seems to be the same way. It's just a symbol of, of our efforts and our creation. So abundance is important to, to get into the realm of you didn't have to create the oxygen you breathe today. You didn't have to pay for that oxygen that you breathe today. We have, I, I would almost say, inalienable rights to these things. Yet we create limitation. We create scarcity. We create doubt. We say that we can't. And then we buy into those stories. And then we live as though that's the truth. And it does become the truth. It, it shows up in our objective reality. We can measure it. But it's simply because of who we perceive ourselves as and what we perceive the world as. And, and from there, we act on it or don't act according to those predictions. And, and it goes all the way back to the story of going to the gym. It's the same idea. I can't. I can never be like them. So we don't. And some people go to the gym and they say, I will be exactly like that or better. And they do. So how is that possible? It's, it's no, it's all right here. And that's what the giant's journey is about. The other thing is feeling good. Mental health is a big topic. I was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder back in 2017, uh, looking for every possibility as a solution around it, going on meds, meeting with psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, none of it was working. I read the book Dare by Barry McDonough. Uh, that made an impact in my life. Now I've learned to manage it. I'm not on meds for it. And it simply comes down to diffusing the energy. It is what it is. We all have emotions. Learning to work with those and manage those is important. So feeling good is important because when you have your full brain, then you can create when you're running from your reptilian brain, your, your lizard brain. We are limited in our capacity to create. We're in survival mode. And in survival mode, it's hard to do anything. And we live in a world that's feeling really fearful and in that, if we allow that to impact us or affect us, then our brains shut off and then we're not creating. And so when we can feel good, we start getting the capacity to get back out there and create big things, giant things. We start visioning. We start having hope for the future. That's what's needed right now. We don't need to fight any more wars or get into any disputes about politics or religion or anything like that. It's simply if we can be at peace, we can create calmness in this storm. Then we get our brains back and then we get into the, the world of hope and vision and we start working toward that and creating that. And then it becomes our objective reality. So feeling good is an important part of the journey because when we have our power, our capacity, we're empowered. That means we're at full power to create everything we want. There's enough energy in the human body that if we were to break it down to the at atomic level and burn that energy up. You could fuel and power every home in the United States for a full day off of a single person. Not that we want to do that, but there's enough atomic energy within us to create that. And then you look at our capacity for learning that we can store the entire internet inside of our brain. There is nothing in the way except for our belief that says we can't do that. And then these fears that get in the way of our emotions that shut us down to where we don't have full capacity. And one thing I've noticed is in the journey of giving back is we give back either directly through charity, through giving back to others of our time, our creations, whatever it is, there's this desire to share it with the world. It's like your book right behind you. It's a version of giving back. 
you go out and you teach others of their power and their potential. And that's part of the journeys is you have this natural tendency to want to give back and share with others and help them to see it in themselves. So those are, those are kind of the, uh, the journeys in a nutshell. I could spend an hour each or, you know, weeks each on, on each of those <laughs> journeys, you know, they're beautiful, but these are all in the book. They're just, they're, they're spread throughout that message, that 30 minute read. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a fantastic read. Uh, I truly appreciated it. And I appreciate you sharing the 12 journeys and, and a lot of your journey through it and how this all came about. If, if there were to be like one or two of those journeys that you would think are maybe the most crucial acceptance and vision, like your life is what it is. Yeah. And vision takes you out of that. Right. I love that. Absolutely love that. That's really good. All right. Well, hey, man, this is a podcast about money. And so I got three questions I got to ask every one of my guests about money. So the first question is, um, what's the smartest thing you've ever done regarding money? And tell me that story. Yeah. Pay, paying off debt first. Mm -hmm. So before savings, I, I clear out debt. And then once debt's cleared out, because that just takes my money out. So it's like, mm -hmm. if that's present, that's that's no fun because the money just keeps going out. So clearing out debt is the smartest thing first. And then from there, savings. Good. Very good. How about the biggest mistake you've ever made regarding money? And tell me that story. Getting into too much debt. <laughs> <laughs> living living beyond my my means. Um, I've I've moved to a more simple life. And so I used to want to have the car, the house, all the things that would say that I have status. And I've learned that within reason, if I, if I can afford to do those things, that's okay. But if I'm extending beyond what I can afford, then I'm just putting myself in a world of hurt. So in the other direction, adding too much debt and then not being able to do what I talked about in the first answer. Love it. Absolutely love it. So what does mastering your finances mean to you? Wow, that is uh, that is that is the giant's journey right there. So, if I were to say mastering, that would be getting really proficient at working with money alongside money. So, not a master over money, but a partner with it would would be the way I would see that. Is that I've created myself in such a way that I'm creating value in the world to create money coming in, and then as it does come in, I'm a good steward and manager. And partner with it that it doesn't rule me and and uh i don't necessarily rule it if that makes sense not in the sense of mastery that i would think of so i would i would be a partner with it that i would i would be able to to manage it and use it to not only serve my needs but the world around me too that's a great answer i really like that yeah thank you yeah thank you those are good questions yeah well i I do do this once or twice. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh so so if any of my listeners want to find you, they want to buy your book, they want to figure out a way to help you get your Pixar movie, how how can they find you? Yeah, so we're we're on social media, Facebook primarily, that's our biggest platform. And the Tribe of Giants on Facebook is our platform there. We also have Wake Up with Giants TV. Uh, on YouTube and Facebook. So if you want to watch the, the podcast and the episodes, we have over 400 uploads to this point. Uh, we just created the Giants Network, the Wake Up With Giants Network. So we have other podcasters coming on our platform and doing shows under the, the Giants brand. Uh, giantsandsmalls.com is the primary website for Giants and Smalls. So you can buy the book there. You can also get it on Amazon. And... Uh, the programs that I run, I usually run those within the the uh, Facebook group. So I will I'll announce those there. And right now I'm running a 12 week program that we start today, which will be pretty fun. Very good. So um, we know how to find you. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Yeah, if I were if I were sitting with you in conversation, uh, the, the biggest thing that I've noticed is uh, Carl Rogers. He's He's a psychologist. He's, I would say he's one of the fathers of psychology, of modern psychology, but he teaches from the point of view that when people can hear themselves and truly hear themselves, that they tend to change themselves. But a lot of times we don't get a chance to really hear what's going on. We're so busy that we don't slow down enough to hear what we're saying, speaking, doing, 
And so to be able to sit with somebody in conversation where you can truly hear yourself is life changing. There are people that will sit with you in conversation, but there's a, an agenda on the other side of it. They're not there to listen to you. They're there to fix you or sell you their product or program. And so I would say if you're going to align yourself with somebody, align yourself with somebody who will help you hear you. Because when you hear you, then you start to shift things. You start to transform and, and be gentle, be gentle and gracious with yourself because there is a lot that might come up that could feel really uncomfortable. So hold some grace for yourself as you go through this. That's a fantastic way to end. Thank you very much, Nick, for being on Solopreneur Money. Yeah, thank you for having me. Well, Solopreneurs, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Nick Smith or Nicholas Townsend Smith of the Giants and the Smalls. All of his information and ways to get a hold of him is in the show notes. Go ahead and check those out now. Uh, my three takeaways are one, wake up, get out of your unconscious state and start to get conscious and understanding of what's going on in your life so that you can then accept what's going on in your life and move on and get moving. So think of this in your business. If in fact that you are just kind of stuck in a rut, start to think about getting out of that rut and then move your way into, all right, well, I'm in a rut. What do I got to do to get out of this rut? And then take action to move forward. And then the third Takeaway is have a vision. He talked about 5,000 visions, 5,000 thoughts and visions and, and ideas of how you can continue to, I guess what I would say is have a purpose in your life and the different visions to continuously reinvent yourself as you continue to go through life. This was, this was a fantastic conversation. I truly enjoyed everything about having uh, Nick on the show. And uh, if you enjoyed it as well, please share this with a friend. Thanks. Have a fantastic day.